Well, this morning we're continuing uh, in our study of Esther, and we're going to be turning to chapter 7 of Esther. I'm going to invite K2 to come on up. He's going to read for us this morning. Um, As you're turning there, you can stand with us as well as we read this together. Good morning. Esther chapter 7. If you don't have a Bible, there are some in front of you. It's on page 488. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. So the king and Haman went in to feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine and after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? And even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. The queen, Esther, answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted to me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. And if we have been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with a loss to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to the Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he and who has dared to do this? And Queen Esther said, A foe and an enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Thanks be to God. That's the word of the Lord. Desires uh, unchecked brings disaster. Desire rightly aimed breathes life. This seems really simple. This idea that desire unchecked brings disaster, but desire rightly aimed breathes life. But I've I've experienced this uh, in many different ways in my life. When I was in uh, second grade, I was voted Sportsman of the Month. Thank you. Um, Because I'm awesome. Um, Last award I got, so second grade. No, I'm just kidding. I never, I never thought about this award as a second grader. Uh, I never acted in such a way to be recognized. That wasn't my aim or intent, but my classmates, everyone got to vote on this. They voted for me, and I, and I won. Um, and, and I share this, again, n- not because I, I'm gloating in my second grade glory, um, but because it, it wasn't intentional. When I was out playing with my friends, I was simply playing. And by their standards, I was, I was fair, I was honest in how we played, I was decent at tetherball and dodgeball and foursquare and all the awesome games that we played. Um, and, and so I, I got this award and I thought, that's pretty cool. And so the next month, we got to vote for somebody else to also receive that award. And my best friend at the time, uh, David Reed, just a, he, he got all these votes. People were so excited because David uh, was honest. He was fair. Uh, he also wore gloves when he played tetherball. So you knew he was serious. Um, and he had this serve that when he threw it, you just got out of the way because if you tried to get in the way, I caught a couple of those off the dome. It didn't feel good. Um, but he was nice about it. He didn't like rub it in your face or anything. And so everyone voted for him. So like it made sense. Like this, this, is, this is a good person for me to pass this award off to. And that's why um, I was so surprised when someone raised their hand in the middle of class to nominate uh, someone else. And, and raising their hand, like they caught Miss Johnson's attention and she kind of turned towards them and, and they said, I would like to nominate Andrew, right? I was like, oh, you know, for Sportsman of the Month, which I think surprised everybody in the classroom, particularly me because uh, it was my hand that was raised and it was, it was my voice that was nominating Andrew. So uh, it, was a, it was a good moment. Needless to say, I did not win back-to-back Sportsmen's of the Month. Um, I don't think they ever voted for me again. Um, but, but I bring this up uh, not because it's the last time. You know, second grade wasn't the last time I had to deal with unchecked desires. Um, but it always makes me laugh because it, it highlights how quickly our actions shift. The month before... I was surprised 
that I had won this award. My actions were not dictated by trying to gain recognition. They were just to do the right thing because it was the right thing. I didn't need recognition, but then suddenly when I got the recognition, I kind of liked it, and I wanted everybody to notice how I was such a good sport and going above and beyond and all those things. And my desire was no longer just to do the right thing because it was the right thing. My desire was to be seen doing the right thing so that others would recognize me for it. See, we do this all the time with good desires that when they're left unchecked, they become devastating to us because they become controlling to us. James, the half-brother of Jesus, he speaks to this very thing uh, in James chapter 1. What can seem like a, a harmless desire or even a good desire can give birth to something far more sinister. Something whose final aim, intent, allure, it leads to, to one thing. It leads to death. So James says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. In the account of Esther, we have been seeing the growing desires of Haman. Uh, they've been blatantly obvious, comical at times, tragic at other times. He is a man who sought his own greatness, his own glory. His desire was for power, for position, and for prominence. He wanted to be the man and he wanted everyone to not only know that he was the man, but to, to recognize it and call it out in him. And this desire, unchecked, would ultimately lead to his undoing. Because he had the power, he had the position, he had the prominence, but still, still there was one person who wouldn't recognize it. One person who would not pay him the honor that he thought was due. And so, uh, as any normal person would do, he sought to kill that person, right? That was Mordecai's solution. But the death of Mordecai wouldn't be enough. He would seek to kill the entire Jewish nation to kill, destroy, and annihilate them. Last week, if you were with us, Pastor Dane walked us through chapter 6. If you're not here, I'd encourage you to go back this week and listen through that and hear the, the message that he brought. It was a good one, a relevant one for each of us. But one of the verses he highlighted was Proverbs 16, 18. It says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We've, we've heard that over and over again, that pride comes before the fall. And last week, we watched in chapter 6 as that uh, came to life uh, in Haman's actions. And what we saw was that Haman was in high spirits after being invited to have a meal with the king and the queen. But as he left the palace and, you know, smile ear to ear, just so excited for his position, his prominence, his power, all things coming together, there was only one thing that was off, and that was that Mordecai would not acknowledge or honor him. And so enraged, he went and he got his counselors, his wife, all together, and they came up with this plan that the best way to deal with your problem was to impale it on a 75-foot-high pole. And so that was what they were going to do. Go talk to the king and tell him, you need to kill Mordecai, and we'll just place him on the post. Everyone will see it. We'll make an example of him. But what we read last week was that that night, the king couldn't sleep. He just happened to not get a good night's rest. God's just orchestrating this beautiful moment. And as the king couldn't go to sleep, he asked for the book of memorable deeds to be read. And it just so happened that the page that it was turned to was a thwarted assassination attempt from some five years earlier. And the one who had thwarted that plot was none other than Mordecai. Think about this for a moment. Five years prior to this moment where we're finding ourselves, Mordecai had learned of an assassination attempt. He had saved the king's life and he had received no recognition for it. And how much did that change Mordecai's actions? From what we see, he just continued to show up at work, do what was the right thing to do, continued to be at the king's gate, continued just to go forward in life. He wasn't hung up on where, where's my due or anything like that. For five years, he went without anything, just continuing forward. 
Until in this moment, the king is hearing these deeds read, and he goes, I need to do something. The urgency becomes uh, so real. He's like, I need to do something to honor this man. And then at that very moment, enter Haman into the court. And so the king goes to Haman. He's like, Haman, I need, I need some ideas of how we can honor this guy. So Haman, I mean, Haman's thinking immediately in this moment. He's like, who could the king possibly want to honor more than me, right? I mean, you see Haman's hand starting to raise, like, I would like to nominate uh, for Sportsman of the Month myself, right? I mean, it's there. And so he goes with this whole plan of, like, he should ride through on the, the city on the king's horse. He should wear a crown. He should wear some of the king's robe. And the king loves this idea. And he was like, yes, all of those things. That's great. Go and find Mordecai. And tell him that he's going to do all that stuff. And you're going to lead him through. You're going, to, you're going to hold the horse for him. You're going to be there proclaiming that he is the man whom the king delights in, right? I mean, you just imagine Haman in this moment. Everything shifts. And now he has to go robe this guy and, and tout him around on a horse throughout the city. So this, this is where we find ourselves in chapter 7. Haman has just been feasting all morning long on humble pie as he's taking uh, Mordecai through the city. And now he's to go and feast with the king and queen one more time because Esther has asked them to come back and take part in a meal with him. But not only that, the last thing that he has playing in his mind is that he had got together his wife and his advisors one more time and what they told him as he's going off to this meal as if Mordecai, before whom, before whom you have begun to fall, as of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but surely fall before him. Right? Really encouraging words as he's heading off to this meal, right? He's, he's already frustrated with all that's going on. And so this is where we find ourselves in chapter 7. So picking up in verse 1. So the king and Haman, they went in to feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. King Ahasuerus and Haman are once again guests of the queen. But the king has not forgotten the purpose of these meals. It's not just a feast. It's not just a fun get-together. But Esther, Queen Esther, has a request. And like we read in chapter 5, the king is ready to grant this request, even up to half the kingdom. She has found favor in his eyes, and he's, he's eager to see what does she want. Why would she take such risks that she has taken? Again, Esther has the king's favor, but we have to remember, because we have a fuller picture of this, of what she's actually coming to ask for. She's coming to ask that the decree that the king has signed, sealed, and already delivered throughout his kingdom, the, the decree that the, the Jewish people were to be destroyed, that that would be overturned. And not only that, she's coming to reveal that the concern she has for the Jewish people is birthed from the fact that she herself is Jewish and she has concealed this from the king the entire time she has been a part of the palace. And what's more is she's coming to reveal that the person who is twisted and brought all this into being is none other than the man that the king had appointed as second in command over all the kingdom. So each of these revelations is significant. She already knows that stepping forward in the way she has was to risk her very life, but she does not know how the king is going to respond in this moment. She's continuing forward courageously and with conviction. But do you remember what Esther had said to Mordecai before, before she kick-started this whole plan? Before she went before the king, she said, if I perish, I perish. See, Esther had found her place in the grand narrative of God's story. And this understanding had given her courage and conviction to speak beyond just what she wanted. It gave her the ability to lay down her life for the good of others. And I think it's important for us to see what has been culminating to this moment. All the tensions we've been feeling, all the comedic moments that have been orchestrated, all the timing that has been impeccable on behalf of God, it's all been coming to this place of request. 
Haman is ready to take a life for his own glory. And Esther is ready to give her life for the glory of God and the good of others. So let's recognize the courage and the conviction of what comes next. But also, not just courage and conviction, let's see the humility, the humility of this moment on behalf of Esther. It's been said that humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of yourself less. If Esther were thinking of only herself, if she was thinking of only her end, She would not be in front of the king. She would be continuing to live her life as the queen, hoping that none of this was discovered that she was Jewish. And yet, because she has recognized the moment, the position, the influence, the opportunity that she has to help her people, she has laid aside those fears, forsaking all and risking all that others may live. It's an incredibly heroic moment. So let's hear these words as the humble conviction of a courageous queen. So verse 3, then Queen Esther answered, if I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. And we're going to see even the way she phrases things is is brilliant. But even in her request, Esther is not distancing herself from the problem. She's not giving herself an out. She's not saying uh, there's a problem with those people. No, where does she begin? She identifies with those people. She says, my life. Would you grant me my life and the life of my people? She understands that her life is at risk, not just the life of her people, but she's willing to risk her life for the life of her people. And as she's making this request, immediately she would have had the full attention of the king. I mean, amidst all the frivolity, the feasting, the food, the wine, everything that they're enjoying, suddenly the king would sober up real fast. As she continues on in verse 4, She says, for we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. If we had only, if we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. So she comes right out with it. We have been sold, king, me and my people. We have been sold. Our lives have been purchased for what? For death for destruction, for total annihilation. Esther, ever the astute politician in these moments, says if we had just been sold, dear king, she's just kind of deferring, the king. if we had just been sold into slavery, that would be one thing. That would be one thing. I wouldn't be troubling you with this. But listen, king, these people that are a part of your kingdom, they are going to be annihilated and they will be no good to you. You're going to lose out on this. And so I I have to come before you to let you know that you're going to lose people from your kingdom. Her terms are clear. Death is what is being demanded. Death is the bondage that she and her people are being sold into. And aside from some miraculous intervention, uh, there is no hope. And so again, Esther lays this out before the king. And as she's walking through her request, the king clearly has heard enough because in verse 5, we see the king interrupts. Then the king Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, who is he and where is he who has dared to do this? Who has dared to do this? For the second time in two chapters, we're about to see the tables turn swiftly on Haman. But in this moment, right here, the king is stunned by what he is hearing. He is incensed. Who would dare come against the queen? This also, again, just shows us kind of the ignorance of King Ahasuerus, that as she's talking about that, that there's like no bells going off in his head of like, oh yeah, I remember signing that decree, right? He's like, what? are you talking about? Who would do this? What is going on? And Esther, continuing forward with courage, 
in the presence of her enemy, names the wicked Haman. Verse six, and Esther said, a foe and an enemy, right? The king's like, who would do this? And I love even the author just continuing to build tension for us because she's not revealing it right away. She's just building it and building it and building it. Who would dare do this? It was a foe and it was an enemy. And the king's like, yeah, I know. Tell me who would do this. It was Haman, the wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. I mean, again, he's still just like basking in all the, humi- the humiliation of what he just had to do with Mordecai. And now Haman is realizing and recognizing that his very life is on the line here. And so terror courses through his body and with good reason because Haman should have recognized as Esther starts walking through the accusations that someone is out for my people and for me that they have decided to kill, destroy, and annihilate that that language was even written in the decree. Haman should have known this language well. He should have started to feel the panic. He should have started to feel the pale throughout all his body and and what was about to come next. And so we're told that the king arose, verse 7, from his, in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden, but Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. So the king's reaction and hearing this news, he walks out of the room. He just gets up and he walks out of the room. We're not told what he's thinking in this moment. We're not given any of those details. We can try and fill in those cracks with all the creativity that we want, but we we don't know. Did he leave because he was so incensed he's gathering his thoughts? Is he reeling from a sense of betrayal that his right-hand man had plotted to kill his own wife? Was he waking up to the fact that it was his actions and his apathy in signing that decree that had brought this whole thing about, that unbeknownst to him, he was calling for the very death of his queen? We don't know why the king leaves. But we do know, according to court procedure, that when the king left the presence of the queen, Haman should not have stayed. You were never, ever to be alone with the queen. There were men that were killed in the Persian Empire because they had bumped into one of the king's concubines. And now he's standing alone with the queen, and he doesn't flee from the scene. He actually turns to her looking for some sense of mercy. But the moment for mercy was lost. His desire to uncheck had led to his own disaster and his own demise. So in verse 8, we read, And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? See, the, queen, the king had left the room. He had gone to uh, what we're told. He's returning from the palace garden, a place of pondering, a place of thinking. But upon his return, what is he confronted by? He sees Haman groveling at the feet of Esther. He's falling on her couch where she was sitting. Haman, the one whose anger was kindled by a Jewish man who refused to to bow before him, is now bowing before a Jewish orphan who had become queen, begging for life. And when the king comes in, he has seen enough. Haman is falling towards Esther, and now he would even assault my queen? And at these words, Haman's fate is sealed As they leave the king's mouth, what do we continue to read? It says, as the words left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. They would cover his face, signifying that death would be the next thing that he would see. Verse 9, then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house 50 cubits high. Now, Harbona, we've heard before, he's listed in chapter 1. He was present during the whole Queen Vashti debacle. 
But what we get to see here is a little bit of the political intrigue in the inner workings of the Persian Empire. Because Harbona right here is making a very shrewd decision. He is watching all of this play out. Haman, who was second in command to be just honored before all people, suddenly has face covered. And so Harbona is not going to jump on that train. He knows that's a sinking ship. And so he starts to make some suggestions here. And he says, "Uh, King, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but Haman had prepared uh, a post to impale Mordecai on. You remember Mordecai? We just honored him today. He's the one that saved your life, right? And it's just standing there. It's 75 feet high. I mean, it would be, it'd be a pity to waste that thing, right? Like it's freshly carved. It's ready to go. His face is covered, right? I mean, he's just kind of inching the king towards like, let's just take care of this now. And so the king in this moment says, hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. In Psalm 7, David writes these words. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violent descends. As we've already read from James, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Haman, pursuing his own path to glory, was in the end consumed by his own pride. The power that he uh, pursued would end up consuming him. And Haman would meet his end with the tree of death that he had created. Because we remember, even though it says gallows, that that really was not the way in which someone would be executed in the Persian Empire. They would be impaled upon a pole. The word that's used here for gallows can be translated as pole or, or tree. The price of his pride was death. And so we read in the final part of verse 10, Then the wrath of the king abated. Such a curious phrasing at the conclusion of this event. The wrath of the king was abated. The wrath of the king subsided in the death of Haman. Haman hung upon a tree for his pride. And for the people of God, suddenly hope would once again arise. For their great foe had been defeated. See, when we step back and we look at this in the grand scheme of things, we see that Esther is an account of rescue. It reminds us of God's promises, his providence, his sovereignty, his timing. It reminds us to lean in to see the unseen. Haman lost himself in his pride and his desire for glory. Esther found her courage and conviction when she forgot herself and remembered who the real hero of her story is. When she recognized as a child of God, her story is best lived when it's his story. And her story is truly our story. Esther, again, shows incredible courage. But let me remind you, Her courage did not start when she went before the king. Her courage started when she again bowed before the true king. See, it's so easy for us to read these moments in scripture, these highlights, and wonder, would I be able to stand up in a moment like this? Would I have the courage, the wherewithal, to go forward trusting in God in a moment like this? But I think we're starting in the wrong place. Because the truth is, if we're unwilling 
to even listen to God in the small moments, why are we assuming we'll listen in the big moments? We have opportunities each day to listen, to trust in God, to walk with courage and conviction in him. We have to practice that. We have to work that out daily with him. Our faith is so often a a muscle that we, we can grow the more and more we trust in him, the more we give to him, the more we aim our desire at him. Esther used her imperfect life for the sake of others. She lived into the image of her created, mirroring him and modeling what it means to selflessly give of oneself. And I I use that word imperfect intentionally because we don't see a perfect picture of someone in Esther. We see some rough edges. We see some question marks. We see some gray areas and we wonder what's really happening there. And yet she continued to walk forward when she remembered once again who she was in God. So Esther gives us this incredible example of, of courage and conviction and faith, one for us to pursue. And on the other hand, we have Haman, who gives us an incredible example of our desires wrongly placed. Haman's pride would lead to his death. Pride is what got Adam and Eve removed from the garden in the first place. Pride is this this sin that just weaves itself into us. That places us at the center of our story and we want everything else to orbit around us, to our likes and our rights and our wants. But our story is best lived not centered around us, but centered around our king and when we live for him and where he wants us to go and what he wants us to do. It was Haman's refusal to see the glory of his maker that would lead him to not be exalted, but instead impaled upon that post and upon that tree. But whenever we're reading through Scripture, it's, it's important to remind ourselves, how are we reading Scripture? And the reason I ask that is because it's, it's very easy to read into Scripture what we want how I want this story to go. I think this might be a better ending. This would fit more of the way in which I want to live. That's not what we want to do. We want to do proper exegesis. I mean, we want to draw out the meaning of the text that's in front of us, these words that God has given us, and say, what, what's your intended meaning here? But not only do we want to draw out what God's intended meaning is, we also want to have a right hermeneutic the way in which we approach the study of Scripture, the lens through which we are looking at. And again, we can bring all sorts of lenses into it. We can bring our own individualism into it. We can bring our own national ideas into it. We can bring our own sense of justice, uh, race, uh, injustice, uh, covenantal looks, uh, liberation theology, dispensational theology, all these different lenses that we can put before Scripture and say, that's how I'm going to choose to see this. But I'll tell you what has been really helpful for me when I approach Scripture. As a follower of Jesus, as one who has been transformed by the life, death, and resurrection of him, I want to I read Scripture how he would read Scripture. I want him to guide me. I want him to lead me. I want the Spirit to, to give me eyes to see. And how did Jesus look at Scripture? How did Jesus teach Scripture? I think one of the best examples we have of the risen Lord teaching scripture is found in Luke 24. As he's walking along the road to Emmaus with with two disciples that are feeling the sting of Jesus' death. They're confused as to what's happening and Jesus shows up and they don't recognize him. There's always this question of why don't they recognize him? They don't recognize him. Maybe it's just their grief was so significant they couldn't believe the possibility that he was alive, but he's walking with them. And as he's walking with them, what does he begin to do? He begins to teach them scripture. And how does he teach them scripture? Well, in Luke 24, 27, it says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. 
What was Jesus saying in this moment? Everything that came before me is pointing to me. Everything that comes after me is pointing to me. And so we have this Christological lens that we look at Scripture through. So even here, as we're in the midst of Esther, in light of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, it's hard for me to ignore that last phrase at the end, and then the wrath of the king abated. Because to abate wrath doesn't mean to satisfy it. It doesn't mean to put an end to it. It means that it was kind of, okay, it calmed down, but it wasn't dealt with entirely. That there's still wrath, there's still death, there's still things that need to be taken care of. And, and what's more is when we look at the story of God's people, what do we constantly see happening to us as we're put into slavery, we're in bondage to sin, we're under the, the, uh, the leaders of opposing nations that have no belief in God. And what does Esther plead before King Ahasuerus? She says, me and my people, we have been sold We have been sold to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. And like the people of God, we have been sold into the bondage of sin. We are sold on this every day, and it is killing us. It is killing us. We are pursuing desires contrary to God all the time and it is robbing us of the joy of living. It is robbing us of loving our neighbor well. It is robbing us of finding satisfaction in God. It is destroying and killing and annihilating us. And in some cases, it's been so uh, effective that it's lulling us to sleep and we're settling for simply passing through life instead of living but we have been called to so much more. We have been rescued and redeemed by the true king who has dealt with the wrath that we deserved and not merely abated, it has been satisfied. And we have been called to live lives of courage and conviction. To raise our hands, not to our own glory, to point to ourselves, but to raise our hands on behalf of others, to use our voice and our lives to point to another possibility of truly living in relationship with God. But we have to remember that the price of our pride is death. The price of our pride is the wrath of God. Romans 2, 5 and 8 says, But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and there will be fury. There will be a tree that you will be impaled upon. We are born into this world competing for supremacy with God. We want our way. We want our kingdom come. Our will be done. But the way in which we truly live and are designed to flourish is when we say, your kingdom come. Your will be done. Haman wanted all eyes on him. You may not want all eyes on you. You might just want to be left alone. (laughs) Comfort may be your king. Safety may be your king. Your individual rights may be your king. We, we all can have a good desire that wrongly aimed and unchecked can lead us to death. And Jesus reminds us that's not our only option. There's a better way. In John 3, 36, he says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. 
Again, Jesus is saying, you believe in me, you will have life, true life. But if you don't, then the wrath of God remains upon you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 10, for God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we live with him. God has a plan. He has a desire that even in Esther, we see him rescue his people. And for a moment, they feel some uh, relief. There's some abatement, but there's still not satisfaction. We're going to see there's still a lot to go in the book of Esther. And there's still more death to come in the book of Esther. The price of our pride is death. And it's not fully met until Christ Romans 5, 9, and 10, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And then finally, let me just read from Ephesians 2, 8, and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I know that was a wall of scripture coming at you. But it's a reminder that we are all children of wrath. That we are all children destined for death if left to our own devices. But we have a good and true king who has met that wrath with his death. Through the sacrifice of Jesus, freely made on his behalf. It wasn't an accident. Jesus was not surprised. He knew what he came to do. And the gift of grace is eternal life for all who bow to him. But the beauty of this is bowing is just the beginning. Because once we bow, we're not done. Like Esther, we find ourselves sent into the service of our true and cosmic king, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good. So let us as his people walk with courage and conviction in this good. Let us trust that the wrath that was due to us, the tree that we were destined to hang upon, has been satisfied by Christ hanging on that tree on your behalf. So knowing this, knowing this truth, I love what Charles Swindoll says. He says, don't ever try to convince me that some situation in this life is absolutely permanent. God can move in the heart of a king. He can move an entire nation. He can bring down the once impenetrable iron curtain. He can change the mind of your stubborn mate. He can move in the affairs of your community. He can alter decisions of presidents and prime ministers and present day kings and national dictators. No barrier too high. No chasm is too wide for him because he is not limited by space or time, by the visible or invisible. Remember, he lives in a realm that transcends all. And when he does, hang on. You're in for the ride of your life. This is what we are being invited into. When our desire is for him, it breathes life into everything we do. And so my question for you is, where is God inviting you to center your story on him? Not on yourself, but on him. What's he calling you into where he wants you to center your story on him? Where has he placed you specifically in life where he wants you to show up with courage and conviction knowing that the wrath of God has been appeased in the death of Jesus knowing that you now can stand before God not in your own righteousness but in the righteousness of Christ see when we know this it changes everything So then, in light of this, let us live our lives raising our hands again, not for our own attention, but with the conviction of the prophet Isaiah that says, here am I, send me. 
Will you pray with me? Father, we read this story in these moments in history and it's so easy for us to root against the bad guy, to root against Haman and his heinous ways, his plots, his schemes, but Lord, I also pray that you would open our eyes to help us see that Haman's in all of us that our pride unchecked, our desires unchecked leads to disaster. Our sin unmet leads to death. And so, Father, if there's any uh, grievous way in us, any part that is turning from you, would you bring us back? Would we recenter our story on you? And Lord, like Esther, would we have the courage and conviction and the faith and the humility to say yes to you. And God, I just I thank you that we can read an account like this and it ends with uh, the wrath of a king abated, buying time. But we can stand secure that your wrath has been met by the body and the blood of Jesus and that we can stand secure in your salvation and that you invite us to participate in living out your kingdom values here and now. So God, would we? Would we step forward in your strength? Would we step forward saying yes to you? Would we make you the center of our story in all things? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The price of our pride, the price of our sin has been paid in full by Jesus. Where we were dead in our transgressions, we have been brought to life in him. So as we leave from here this week, let us take these words from Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Let's aim our affection, our attention towards him. Let us place him at the center of our story and let us pray for the courage and conviction and humility to follow. May you know his grace and may you live in his peace. God bless you. We'll see you next week.